Thank you all for joining us today. This is the third and final session of using UN Biodiversity Lab to support national conservation and sustainable development priorities. My name is Amber McCullum, and I will be your presenter alongside some great guest speakers today. Christina Supples from the UNDP, who you heard from in session one, along with Rafael Monge, Director of the National Geo Environmental Information Center, and Christian Vargas, researcher in Laboratory Prius from National Center for High Technology, and they're both from Costa Rica, and Susana Rodriguez Beretica, leader of the Researcher Spatial Ecology Lab and Biodiversity Science Program at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute in Bogota, Colombia. For this training, we will have three one and a half hour sessions. Our first two were on March 21st and March 24th and March 31st, and today is April 7th, the final training. We will pre be presenting the same content in three different live sessions. We are presenting the sessions live in English, French, and Spanish, and are really excited to have this be our first French training. You will only need to attend one session per day, and you can find all the course material on the website listed here. And after each session, we will have a question and answer portion. Feel free to type in your questions into the Q&A box along the way, and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. We will also post the questions and, answer, and answers onto um, a Google document on our website after the training. If we don't get to a question, you can also email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at the email address listed here. We will have one homework, and that homework is now available on the training website. This covers content from the lecture as well as the exercises on the UN Biodiversity Lab Mapper. And um, that's the, the tool that we've really focused on throughout this training. To receive credit for the homework, you will submit all your answers uh, via Google Forms by Tuesday, April 21st. So that's two weeks from now. In order to receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. As I mentioned in previous trainings, um, the only prerequisite is um, the fundamentals of remote sensing or equivalent experience. And also, once again, the course materials can all be found on our website shown here. And this includes a, a PDF of the presentations, a link to view the recording from each week's webinar, and all of those will be available on our YouTube channel as well. And um, now the link to the um, Google Form homework submission is on the website as well. Here's an overview of the course. Today we will hear how specific countries are focusing on using the UN Biodiversity Lab and data sets they have available um, and really using spatial data to support conservation efforts. This week we will begin with an overview of the global perspectives on the challenges and success stories of using spatial data for monitoring ecosystem health and threats. We will hear from country representatives from Costa Rica and Colombia about their experiences using spatial data for conservation. We will finish off today with a brief training summary, and we will end with a question and answer session like we have done in our other sessions. So now I'd like to hand it over to our first guest speaker today, Christina Supples. Senior Technical Specialist for the United Nations Development Program. So over to you, Christina.
Thank you for the introduction, Amber. I'm excited to show you the content of our third and final webinar now. As you can see on the screen, today I'll start by providing a recap of our two previous sessions. Then I'll spend a few minutes sharing trends in the use of spatial data around the world to improve biodiversity outcomes. And last, I'll turn it over to Rafael and Christian from Costa Rica and Susana from Colombia to explore how their countries are also using spatial data to support conservation planning, monitoring, and reporting. So let's start with a quick recap. During our first webinar, we provided you with an introduction to NASA satellites and sensors, gave you an overview of key global agreements that govern international environmental policy, and third, introduced you to UNDP's efforts to use spatial data to improve outcomes for nature and people around the world. In our second webinar last week, we trained you on how to use the UN Biodiversity Lab to access and visualize spatial data and run basic spatial analyses. If you missed either of these webinars, don't worry. You can access the recordings and presentations online, and we are still happy to take any questions you have over email. So I wanted to start by spending a few minutes taking you on a quick trip around the world to see how spatial data is being used to improve biodiversity outcomes. First, I want to recall the reasons why we created the UN Biodiversity Lab with our partners. In 2017, we analyzed hundreds of biodiversity policy documents on the state of nature and related actions to protect, restore, and conserve it around the world. We found an average of four spatial analyses in each document. One of those four maps was typically of the country's political boundaries, and that was it. We became really curious about why countries weren't using maps and data during their conservation planning and reporting efforts. To figure out the drivers of this data gap, we then directly asked 140 developing middle income and small island nations about this trend. And we learned four really interesting things. First, spatial data are often inaccessible to national policymakers. The information on nature that scientists and policymakers need is typically scattered among multiple ministries and requires complicated data sharing agreements to access. Second, accessible spatial data is often in unusual formats. For example, they may be inconsistent, inaccurate, of low spatial resolution, incompatible at the wrong time scale, or simply too out of date to be meaningful. Third, Governments can't typically use data that's developed by experts outside of their country. Before a government can use a spatial data set for decision making, it must be validated for accuracy and approved for use in the country. And then fourth, government agencies often lack the capacity and equipment to process spatial data, analyze it, and apply results in meaningful ways. Once we better understood the drivers of this data gap, we saw a huge opportunity to develop tools and trainings to help build the capacity of policymakers to use spatial data to support their efforts to protect nature and improve development opportunities. Mm -hmm. So as part of this effort, we created the UN Biodiversity Lab in partnership with UN Environment and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. In 2018, we challenged all parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity to double the number of spatial analyses they're using to report on the status of nature in their country and the effectiveness of related conservation actions. We offered the UN Biodiversity Lab as a tool to help countries meet this challenge. But we also offered technical support program to help build capacity. Each country we work with is different, and therefore we did not expect all countries to use the UN Biodiversity Lab exclusively. Our goal was to help each country use spatial data in whatever way best addressed their national needs. For some countries, the UN Biodiversity Lab meets their needs and makes it possible for them to access and analyze spatial data in a way that would not otherwise happen. For other countries like Colombia and Costa Rica, who we're gonna hear from today, they already have very sophisticated GIS resources and serve as an aspirational model for other governments. So I'm sure you're curious, did countries meet the challenge of doubling the number of spatial analyses they're using to monitor, report, and plan for nature conservation? Yes, they did. And let's look at how they did it. To determine this answer, our team analyzed almost 2,000 maps 
in 134 six national reports that were submitted to the Secretariat to the Convention on Biological Diversity between December 2018 and November 2019. These reports analyzed the status of biodiversity in each country and also the effectiveness of actions in meeting the goals of the convention. We looked at the number and types of maps included, as well as their usefulness for conservation policymaking. And we use the number of maps included in each report as a proxy for a country's improved ability to access and use spatial data. As you can see from the results on this screen, we saw an over two time increase in the number of spatial analyses used to determine the status of nature across all of the countries we analyzed. For the countries that we provided a technical support package to, we saw the number of spatial analyses increase from an average of four maps from previous policy documents to an average of 20 in these reports. As you can see on this slide, the number of maps that policymakers used to identify where they should take conservation action also increased. As we discussed before, having access to spatial data and knowing how to analyze it can really help guide decision making. For example, spatial analyses can help us determine where to site a new protected area or how to focus restoration efforts. The result is a roadmap for future action. So in summary, this analysis helps demonstrate the impact that capacity building efforts can have on improving the use of spatial analyses to address conservation needs at the national scale. I'm happy to talk more about this study, our methods and our results during the question and answer portion of this webinar. So now let's take a quick tour around the world to learn about how countries are using spatial data to improve conservation and development outcomes. First, let's visit Iraq. As of one year ago, only 2% of Iraq's land was protected. Although the government has proposed an additional 19 sites for protected area designations, the country still falls woefully short of an international target of protecting 17% of terrestrial land area by 2020. The green shapes that you see on the screen are Iraq's existing protected areas. And these spatial data are coming from the WCMC World Database on Protected Areas. To help bridge this gap, Iraq is using the UN Biodiversity Lab to identify locations for new protected areas. The Ministry of Health and Environment and Nature Iraq surveyed 82 key biodiversity areas to collect information on site characteristics, biodiversity, and threats. The results of the survey were mapped. This same working group is now using that spatial data to communicate with policymakers about the location, ecosystem services, and economic benefits of these areas, and to guide decision making around which of these areas should be formally protected. On the screen, you can also see a map of human pressures within protected areas. These data are helping the government assess how to more effectively manage these existing lands. Now let's travel east to Vietnam. Did you know that Vietnam is ranked 16th among the Earth's most biodiverse countries? But in the last 20 years, Vietnam's population has increased from 73 million in 1995 to over 96 million in 2017. This growth is creating a large demand for natural resources and they're being much more rapidly consumed. As a result, data show that Vietnam's unique ecosystems Forest, coral reefs, seagrass, and mangroves are under continued threat to overexploitation, unsustainable use, and environmental pollution. Vietnam is using spatial data to show where human pressures are impacting protected areas and key forest areas in the country. On your screen, from left to right, you can see maps of first, on the left, forest cover loss from the year 2000 to 2017, second, in the middle, a map of biodiversity intactness, and third, on the right, a map of human footprint from 2009. A comparison of these maps shows that, first, you can determine the areas that are experiencing the greatest amount of human impact. They're also the ones that are experiencing the greatest amount of biodiversity and habitat loss. Increased urbanization and human expansion are demanding additional land and resources. Many of these resources are coming at the expense of Vietnam's forests. 
and the destruction of these ecosystems is leading to massive habitat and species loss, as well as a loss of carbon stores. It's also putting the country at a higher risk for climate change related to environmental disasters. It's amazing what the power of maps can do to help tell a story. The map you're seeing now shows the level of protection for Vietnam's key biodiversity areas, or KBAs. The government is using these data to identify KBAs in areas with populations that are, have a higher likelihood to be affected by poverty. With this information, they're able to better design programs that can aid these communities while reducing their dependency on protected forests. As you can see, spatial data are helping policymakers in this country to visualize the progress to achieve national biodiversity targets and helping guide more informed action to address gaps during policy implementation. Finally, let's travel to Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea contains the third largest tract of intact tropical rainforest in the world, which it shares with Indonesia. Logging, both illegal and legal, are major industries in each country, and levels of illegal wildlife trade are also very high. The government of Papua New Guinea is using spatial data and monitoring tools to help curtail illegal activities in the country. First, supported by the Red Plus program, two different PNG government authorities have created a web portal that shows where logging concessions are most active. On the map on your screen, logging concessions are shown in green. Forest loss by year is also shown on your screen in different shades of red. This map is available at high resolution and it's helping the government to identify logging concessions extending beyond permitted boundaries, as well as forest loss due to agriculture and oil palm cultivation. I wanted to show you another example of how Papua New Guinea is using spatial data. So the map you can see on your screen this time is a UN Biodiversity Lab data layer on accessibility to cities. And PNG is using it to help address illegal wildlife trade. This map shows the accessibility to cities in southern Papua New Guinea and the Papua province of Indonesia. A map like this can be combined with other maps that show known collection points and the distribution range of the pig-nosed turtle, for example, which is a targeted species of the illegal wildlife trade. Combining data such as these are helping PNG to figure out where to collect more information on the trade of the species, including data on international border movements and trade. PNG is then working with the government of Indonesia to use these data to determine how to better manage these remote border regions. So you've just seen some of UNDP's ongoing work in Iraq, Vietnam, and Papua New Guinea, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. From assessing marine protected areas in South Africa, to mapping indigenous lands in Mexico, to creating new biological corridors in Belize, to assessing the impacts of climate change in Samoa, the countries we work with are using spatial data in creative ways to support their national priorities. From here, I'd like to turn it over to our colleagues in Costa Rica to talk more about their work. We have Rafael Monje, Director of the National Geo-Environmental Information Center in Costa Rica, and Christian Vargas, Researcher at Laboratory Prius from National Center of High Technology in Costa Rica. Rafael and Christian, over to you. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction, and greetings, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar using the UN Biodiversity Lab to support national conservation and sustainable development priorities. During this presentation, you will hear from Christian Vargas, researcher with the Prius Lab of the National High Technology Center of Costa Rica, and myself, Rafael Monge, director of the National Geoenvironmental Center, which is itself a part of MINAI, or the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. I'll turn things to, over to Christian, who is in charge of the first part of the presentation. Our country is an geographically privileged location where climate and connectivity on both land and water are key factors that maximize biodiversity. 
our national territory is relatively small, 51,100 square kilometers. This area becomes 11.5 times larger if we count our marine surface area. In this territory, according to the report of the State of Biodiversity in Costa Rica, published in 2019, we've managed to identify 6.5% of the world's expected biodiversity within our territory. This represents a huge international commitment to protect these resources appropriately through sustainable development. Aware of this wealth, the country has adopted a series of public policies focuses on the conservation and sustainable use of resources, such as the National System of Conservation Areas that today protects 27% of our country, where these key ecosystems are located, such as Marine Conservation Area Cocos, located 532 kilometers from our Pacific coast, and where we find Coco Island National Park and the Marine Management Area, Simons. This policy, in combination with other public policies, such as the Payment for Environmental Services Program, has allowed us to have forest coverage in 52% of our territory. Nature is important, both for Costa Rica and the rest of the world. According to the WWF report, Living Planet, nature provides services to human beings valued at $125 trillion annually. On the other hand, 70% of population in poverty in the world lives in rural areas and depend directly on biodiversity for their survival and well-being. The high-level panel for global resource assessment shared with implementing the strategic plan for biodiversity 2011 and 2020. Estimate that at least $125 billion at are needed to meet the requirements identified in the Aichi biodiversity targets. However, only $55 billion for this process in 2018. In Costa Rica, the Biofin project estimates that between 2010 and 2018, $255 million were invested annually in biodiversity which correspond to 0.5% of GDP. This project complements the country's national biodiversity policy and supported the formulation of the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. The policy has four main axes and 23 strategic teams are created with associated goals. Below, we will present some examples of goals of the National Biodiversity Strategy and how they interrelate with the IG goals and with the information available at the UN Biodiversity Lab. On the website, imbcr.go.cr, you will find information on all of the goals and update follow-up reports made by all the institutions responsible for each of them. The strategy team one related protected area system where target one calls for an increase in the size of protected wildlands and marine conservation areas. This target pertains to Aichi goals 5, 11, and 15. 15. As a result, we expect to have a series of technical studies that will allow us to determine how feasible it is to create and inaugurate new protected wild areas in key ecosystems. In addition, they are working on build of scenarios for the creation of areas in island waters.
Another example is represented with the FreedNet species team, where goal 18 consists of a national list of endangered species and FreedNet species update every five years. This is linked to Aichi, Aichi target 12 and 19. The results obtained thus for have been the proposal of the endangered species list at the beginning of the methodological review process for the updating of the list. This information can be combined with the ecoregion and human pressure data layers related to protected areas available on UN Biodiversity Lab to carry up analysis of key sites where increased conservation efforts for threatened species and endangered species in Costa Rica. Finally, the team of biodiversity associated with health and production system where Goal 25 established that by year 2020, there will be a geographical characterization and identification of the main agricultural system. This target related to Aichi Goal 7. The information generated by this process will relate to UN Biodiversity Lab data crops suitable and population density for 2020. And with this, carry out an increasingly detailed analysis of the country situation on this topic. The National Biodiversity Strategy represents the information base in Costa Rica used for six national report to the Convention on Biolo Biological Diversity, which in turn use spatial information more intensively, including both national and global data from the Forest Integrity Project, which are available in the UN Biodiversity Lab. One important result is shown under the topic of landscape connectivity, which is being used to formulate policies to support decision making related to the Biodiversity Index, as you can see in the image. The biodiversity index can correlate to the wild protected areas and biological corridors layers based on Costa Rica's current protected territory. As can be seen in the image, the biodiversity index can be correlated with the layers of protected wild areas and biological corridors to analyze the behavior of biodiversity according to the current protected territory of Costa Rica. Example of this, the importance of the connectivity that exists in the extreme northwest of the country between the Canacaste Conservation Area and the Arenal Tempisque Conservation Area is observed. The information of the human footprint was also used in the preparation of the sixth report. According to the image of this map, it is the note that there is a high disturbance in related sites such as a human settlements and intensive cultivation areas in the Caribbean and the northern zone of the territory where extensive banana and pineapple crops are located. On the other hand, in the extreme west, and Northwest recovery areas can be seen due to the protection of fragmented forest present. The information of the forest structural condition index was also used in the construction of the sixth report. When analyzing this, this information with the map of protected wild areas, the limited in light green, we can see that within these territories, the index shows high values which enhance the importance of protecting these territories in Costa Rica. Then I leave you with Rafael Monge, who will be in charge of the next part of the presentation.
Thank you, Christian. With the goal of making the process of generating and using environmental information in the country for decision-making systematic, Costa Rica has been working on developing their national environmental information system, the CINIA, and the National Land Cover Land Use and Ecosystem Monitoring System, CIMOCUTE. These systems include technological and communication components which allow a certain interaction with the different types of data users and coordination with national and international organizations to bolster the use of national data with global data about our country. On the CINIA website, you can find, you can find different modules that we put together to disseminate information in the forms of statistics, documents, and maps. This communication tool allows us to share the data generated and compiled by different sources, like the ones my colleague Christian showed you previously. An important part of our communications strategy is dissemination or sharing through channels that are easily accessible to the population, such as the National Environmental Information System at Facebook. This platform allows us to interact with users and analyze how we could continue to improve our communication strategies based on their feedback. In this slide, we show you an example of one of our more popular publications we come up with where we provide information about the location of indigenous territories in our country. Now, we will go to an exercise that shows how we are integrating the UN Biodiversity Lab data and the information we generated locally in our country within the National System of Environmental Information. In February 2020, the Ministry of Environment and Energy published new data layers created with the tool MOCU, which itself was developed by the PRIAS laboratory with support from the UNDP. This tool monitors key productive landscapes, which include pineapple, oil palm, and grasses less than 30% tree cover. The latest data are from year 2018. In the case of grasslands, the available information is the result of a pilot study that conducted as a spatial analysis of the territory that makes up the La Amistad Pacifico Conservation Area, located in the southeastern part of the country, which generated the layers that are highlighted in this map. We analyzed this information along with gridded lives, the layer, gridded livestock of the world related to cattle, uh, available from the UN Biodiversity Lab for the year 2005, which reflect the intensity of land use for cattle ranching measured by heads of cattle per square kilometer. Combining this data, we generated the map that we share in the, on the screen which you can also generate and carry out a more in-depth analysis using the UN Biodiversity Lab platform, where you can also find all the layers of the productive landscapes that we generated with the MOCU initiative. Next, we will show you a practical exercise so that you can learn how to do this yourselves. First, you have to go to the UN Biodiversity Lab platform available anywhere in the world in the address unbiodiversitylab.org. Here, to view the information of our country, just type here Costa Rica. And the system will automatically show our location in the map. And soon we'll display the layers available for the analysis. Well, here we can first look for the layer that we use for livestock here, the graded livestock of the world cattle. To activate it, just drag it to the map and 
here you can see the layer in the map but also some detailed information about how to interpret the, the colors and some other information for instance the year of this information that is 2005 okay now we will look for the other layer that we use that is for pastures um, you have to look for it it's you can see that there is a lot of information here available to do different kind of analysis and uh, well, we see here the information from Ocup is in Spanish Pastos menor a 30% de cobertura arbórea 2018 piloto oh, to activate it just drag it also to the map and then we can see them both combine and uh, we can for instance zoom in to make a better analysis of the information here to San Vito and you can see for instance the difference between the scale of the information the from the global layer and the information from the from the layer that we generate for with Moku In addition to the exercise we just went through, we'd like to show you another initiative that we are working on in our country with the support of various international partners like UNDP, with whom we are using nationally and globally available spatial data to escalate the decision-making processes in the areas of conservation and sustainable development. We call this initiative the Big Enchilada, and with it, we seek to map the essential life support areas, which are areas where if measures are taken to protect, sustainable manage, or and restore ecosystems, it's not only possible to safeguard biodiversity, but we can also safeguard essential ecosystem services, including carbon sequestration, food security, water supply, and disaster risk reduction. We started this process formally with an in-person workshop with some remote, remote participation in October 2019, with the participation of representatives from the Costa Rican government and the academy, as well as some of the best scientists and international data providers. In this workshop, four critical steps for the development of the big enchila were identified. The first one is identifying key policies which were prioritized based on the areas defined in the project. Among the policies we took into account are the National Biodiversity Strategy and the National Decarbonization Plan, among other policies. Subsequently, we identified targets and key indicators included in these policies. When we then continue to identify available global and national spatial data that can be used to map these goals. We're currently in this stage in the process and, we, and have identified large quantities of data for this purpose, where the information available in the UN Biodiversity Lab and the layers generated in the forest integrity project, project stand out, as well as various local layers pertaining to different topics generated by Costa Rican institutions. Finally, we will use a systematic conservation planning methodology to map essential life support areas. By the end of the process, we hope to develop a map like the one shown on the screen which identifies the areas where we need to protect, manage, or restore the ecosystems in such a way that we can meet our policy goal through nature-based solutions. To continue improving the way we do things in our country, we have identified a series of future challenges that we want to share with you to finish this presentation. One of, our, of the main challenges that we must work on is the standardization of data and methodologies in state institutions. This is through the integration of report generation processes 
at the national and international level. This is part of the work that we're doing with Simokute in, regard, in regards of monitoring the coverage and use of land and ecosystems in our country. In addition, we are working on improving the processes for integrating and validating information generated both locally and globally in order to strengthen the decision-making process. This is the case of, where we're, of what we are developing with some of the targets of the National Biodiversity Strategy. Finally, one of the challenges that we have contemplated for this year is the publication of the Environmental Account of Ecosystem Services for Costa Rica. This initiative is developed by combina combining economic analysis with available spatial information, implementing the standards of the United Nations Environment and the, uh, the United Nations System of environment and environmental and economic accounting. This will allow us to develop a better understanding of the true value of the key ecosystem services that nature provides to the Costa Rican population. Well, this has been our country's experience with using spatial data to support nature conservation. We welcome any questions, comments, or feedback about the information we shared with you today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Rafael and Christian, for sharing this example. It's exciting to hear about all of your work. Now we're going to move a bit further south to hear from Colombia. Today we have with us Susana Baritica Rodriguez, lead researcher for the Spatial Ecology Lab and Biodiversity Science Program at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute in Bogota. Susanna, over to you. Um, okay, thank you so much to UNDP and uh, NASA Archet for the invitation. Um, my name is uh, Susana Rodriguez Buritica. I'm a researcher at Alexander von Humboldt Institute in Colombia. And if you don't know, um, Humboldt Institute is a public uh, institution attached to the environmental ministry in Colombia. We are um, in charge of being kind of the interface between uh, science, policy, and society, um, in charge of translating scientific information for decision making, especially in the public sector. So uh, we are dividing several programs on the projects and products that I will be presenting today are uh, taken from three of those programs. Um, those are highlighted in green on your screen. Um, uh, biodiversity science, monitoring and evaluation and territorial management. And the two main uh, globally, uh, publicly available global products that we have been using. Um, one of them is the forest structural condition uh, published uh, last year by Sandra Hansen and collaborators. And it basically uh, portrays the structural condition of forest based on canopy height, uh, percentage cover, and time of disturbance. Um, the small areas on the map uh, represent areas where we have been using the information from this map in our analysis, and I will explain that later on. And the second product that we have been using extensively is the um, uh, forest fragmentation that uses uh, morphological spatial pattern analysis. Um, to categorize each pixel according to its position in the landscape and its function, and could be interpre interpreted um, as uh, categories along a fragmentation gradient. And again, the areas highlighted in the maps are study areas for us. These maps have been, been developed for 2000 and, 2000 and uh, 2013, which give us a uh, a dynamic aspect uh, of fragmentation. So from the from the first program, uh, biodiversity science. This program is in charge of um, 
gathering basic information on species and strategic ecosystems and their resources for different groups at different levels of uh, observation uh, from an ecological perspective. Um, so we use those two uh, products, the forest um, uh, condition and the fragmentation dynamics, to characterize um, degradation in tropical dry forest. If you don't know, dry tropical forest in Colombia is one of the more most threatened ecosystems. Only 8% of its original coverage uh, or extent is left. Um, so we combine those two um, layers with others, uh, portraying forest dynamics, land cover change, human pressure dynamics, and temporal trends on climatic variability, um, and temporal trends on ecosystem functioning variables, the greenness, uh, over a time span between 2000 and 2015 to um, run a hierarch hierarchical cluster analysis um, that describes how degradation behaves uh, in Colombia. So running only the climatic variables, we found that for the almost 400 points uh, that have been also validated on the ground, um, the behavior correlates uh, very well with regional trends or with regions within Colombia. So for example, all the red points on the map uh, are located in the Orinoquia, which is the plains region in Colombia, the eastern part. And most of the orange uh, uh, points corresponding to the first group of the clustering uh, correspond to areas in the Caribbean region. So except a couple of points, most of them uh, correspond to natural regions within Colombia. But when you consider more than the climatic variables and include also the dynamics of uh, pressure or forest condition, then the pattern changes, which indicates that even though there is a strong signal of climatic variation, there is, uh, there is no so strong signal um, at that level and the degradation uh, patterns could be explained more at the local level. The second, uh, the second project uh, uses that information to um, specifically ask what is the uh, response of biodiversity to that degradation uh, within dry tropical forest. And if you remember in the previous maps, I have several several areas, and here some of those areas are highlighted. And within those areas, we run a study um, in which we categorize uh, six watersheds according to the uh, transformation gradient, and we follow for biological groups over two years um, to describe their structure and composition. And those six watersheds are the ones portrayed on the map. The dots on the map are just the places where permanent plots for vegetation, vegetation monitoring are uh, placed. And these are our reference uh, for the evaluation of biodiversity. We basically have run uh, some analysis um, 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 asking how um, if there is synchronicity in the response of the different groups um, to transformation. And this series of maps show that um, there is no necessarily synchronicity. Well, doesn't show that, but shows that there is a strong response to the transformation gradient. Uh, so the plots uh, group themselves according to transformation for their different groups. Um, and we are right now um, asking the question of which variables are more important for each uh, for each uh, group. And this is, um, according to our preliminary uh, analysis, this is um, this is the analysis that tells us that there is no synchronicity. So for some groups, uh, fragmentation is more relevant, and for other, others, is forest degradation, for example. Um, but 
these type of analysis are just um, ongoing. The uh, third uh, use of the information um, was um, a couple of uh, projects, for a couple of projects that have emphasized exploring new areas. And if you are not familiar with Colombian um, history or current situation after the, the peace deal agreement, many of the areas that were restricted uh, for access um, by the guerrillas um, uh, are areas that have not been explored for a very long time. And so there has been a lot of emphasis of getting into those areas to describe biodiversity and their condition. Um, so in this project, for example, we use the information to inform where uh, explorations should be occurring. So the map shows areas with high levels of information in dark and brown, dark brown or in, in brown color, and areas with high integrity forests in uh, violet. So as you can see, there are several areas with very little information that have high integrity forests, and those are the areas that we have recommended for exploration. The final use of uh, spatial data within the program is the identification of areas that, despite the history of transformation, have been stable. And the rationale here is that these areas um, could contain communities that, given that stability, uh, will present the, the best um, structural condition uh, out of those communities. And, in that sense, provide valuable uh, ecological information about community assembly and community um, adjustment to transformation. So the way we identify those areas was, was again, using the two um, data layers that I have been talking about, plus uh, um, a layer of human uh, footprint uh, developed within Humboldt, and I will explain that later, um, in combination with uh, dynamic variables like wilderness loss or in the case of forest, forest dynamics since 2000. We combine those areas and the result is the map. This was done for the state of Boyacá, which is a state northern from Bogotá. And in the map, I portray the stable areas by ecosystem. And, and just to give you an example, the blue areas are Paramos, which is like high altitude ecosystems in Colombia. And for most of the paramos, there are many areas that could be considered stable and in good condition. But for other ecosystems like dry tropical forest or, or lowland tropical forest, those stable areas are um, less, are smaller. So our recommendation is to uh, evaluate those areas before it's too late if you are interested in, in ecological studies. Now, from the territorial management uh, uh, program, so the idea with this program is to uh, present or produce concrete concrete recommendation for land recommendations for land management. And the first example I will um, give you is the Ram Amazonia project. Um, the idea within this project was to build a portfolio for restoration opportunities for the Amazonia. And um, colleagues within the program use, again, the forest integrity layer to identify those forest patches categorized, they categorized those forest patches in terms of their size, the perimeter, their structural condition, and the overall degree of fermentation for the landscape. They combined that with information, uh, hydrological information that gives them the areas with susceptibility for flooding, for example. Um, and with other information in terms of erosion potential or erosion susceptibility. So what I'm showing you in this map are areas for which different restoration strategies should be taken according to that information. So for example, they identify erosion, erosion susceptible areas for which a certain restoration strategy should taking on flooding uh, susceptible areas where other restoration strategies should be taken uh, and so forth. So 
this was the end uh, product of that uh, information analysis. But many of the projects, or all of the projects that I have been showing you so far, use um, external kind of information, the fragmentation and the forest condition. But the the next part of the talk, I will be I will be showing you more uh, products or approaches that have been developed within Humble and that could or could not use external information. So one of those is the development of the human footprint for Colombia. This is a multi-temporal analysis. There are two sets of uh, maps on your screen. The, the left one shows the um, human footprint index on you know, different time periods since 1970. And the, the one on your right shows the dynamics uh, between periods. Um, the warm colors in both maps indicate high uh, either uh, uh, footprint or high um, dynamics or, or strong dynamics uh, towards increased impact. Um, so as you can see on the, in the, on the uh, right bottom map, there are areas in Colombia that have experienced intense um, intense transformation, uh, like the eastern plains, um, foothills, and others like the Amazon, Amazonia, where the human impact is less uh, pronounced. So the publication of this product is coming this year, and we have been using this product also for several uh, analysis within Humboldt. The, I think just to highlight the difference between this uh, human footprint and the globally the publicly available global footprint is that uh, we incorporated uh, the time of use uh, from uh, the 1500s. So it's kind of a legacy adjusted uh, human footprint index. Um, this, the final set of products come from the biodiversity assessment and monitoring program. Um, so this program is in charge of analysis and synthesis of biodiversity information. Um, and basically the, the two products uh, that I will be showing you have been uh, aiming to develop a decision support system and improve the estimation of biodiversity indicators. Um, the first big approach of project that will be leading all the efforts within uh, within the, the, the products that I will be showing you is the construction of a, a Colombian bond. So within the framework of the geo bond uh, network. So the idea is to um, uh, boost collaboration within Colombia and at regional level uh, to build a biodiversity observation network to standardize and collaborate regarding biodiversity observation. Um, so my colleague, Maria Cecilia Londonio, is the lead researcher in this effort. Within the same logic, um, they are using the framework of essential biodiversity variables to uh, develop biodiversity indicators. And if you don't know, essential biodiversity variables are putative uh, variables that provide the sufficient and necessary information for monitoring research and forecasting um, biodiversity. So there are some examples of those on your screen, species population, uh, species traits, for example, body size, or phenology, or ecosystem function, for example, um, disturbance. And on the right is the indicator that could be derived from uh, uh, from those um, uh, variables. And these are, for example, biodiversity darkness, range rarity, or, or the human footprint. Um, so the idea is to standardize not only the methods uh, of uh, estimating the indicators, but the methods to get, get in the essential biodiversity variables and to evaluate all sources of information. So this is the general framework of the approach. There, are in, there is information from different sources, not only in situ observation surveys, 
or citizen science data, but remote sensing. The idea is to um, organize them into an infrastructure um, to apply standardized methods to estimate the essential biodiversity variables and to standardize methods to come up with the indicators that ultimately can be used by government uh, agencies, environmental agencies, academic users, or gen the general public at different levels. So um, a product of this um, work of, the, of applying this framework is Bio Tablero, which is the decision support system for Colombia. And this is a screenshot of what Bio Tablero looks like right now. There are three modules. Um, uh, the module on your left uh, is for geographic queries. The module on your on the middle is for uh, biodiversity indicators, and the last module on the right, um, and that is also under development, is uh, for early warnings. So you can explore um, information uh, within each of these three modules. And to give you a, an example of how it looks like from inside. So I, I have just run a query for the state of Boyacá, the same state I have been, uh, I, I presented for the stable ecological areas before. And for this state, uh, if you run the query uh, regarding ecosystems, this is the type of information that you get, the total area of the query, the percentage of natural uh, secondary vegetation transform uh, a cover, um, the percentage of protected areas within the area of your query, and the percentage of strategic ecosystems uh, within the area of your query. For Colombia, the strategic ecosystems are uh, Paramo, uh, dry tropical forest at wetlands, and they are strategic because they have been officially recognized as the strategic and special conservation and management plans should be um, should be addressing the state of these ecosystems. That's why is their core the strategic ecosystems. You can run the query not only for ecosystems but uh, at the landscape level, so you will get information regarding the fragmentation, for example, of the cover change, and for species, how many endemic species there are in your area, how many uh, are in danger or critically in danger, or so. For the second set of queries, uh, the second module, you can you go into directly into the um, specific specifics of the biodiversity indicators. So this is an example. I selected the red list, and you can you can have information in, term, in terms of the temporal trend of the, the red list um, and by group. Um, so the idea is that all the indicators developed uh, will be will have um, like a presentation uh, similar to this. There is a fourth module that is non not for everybody. Uh, it's not for the public, in, but it's more. Um, ha it has been developed for in industry for. Um, uh, for industry in, in Colombia, if you are a business and you affect a natural ecosystem, you have to develop and execute an offset, environmental offset plan. And this module is thought to help business to come up with a sensible plan. So the questions, even though it's, they are in Spanish, I will just translate them. The questions that a module like this could answer is uh, which are the areas that you should conserve, uh, restore, or managed in a special way, where should do all this, and which biological aspect you should be monitoring for your environmental stats. Um, so the final um, the final project um, that I will be presenting is basically within the development of this bio tablero. It was essential to evaluate what information was out there. Um, and the idea with this exercise was just um, evaluating the information regarding estimating the bi biodiversity indicators suggested by the um, um, Convention for Biodiversity. 
uh, evaluating if the information available will answer to those 63 indicators. Um, so the questions were, what do they respond to if they answer to um, sustainable development goals, IG targets, or um, they could be used to estimate um, essential biodiversity variable? And how useful was that information um, under the light of the information that is already available in Colombia? Um, so there, the team evaluated several layers of information coming from three different resources, biodiversity indicators, uh, digital observatory for protected areas, and the UN Biodiversity Lab. And this evaluation um, resulted in these estimations that are on your screen. Basically, 44% 40, of the layers were available, uh, or 44% of the indicators were uh, were could be estimated from the layers available. Um, 64 of the layers um, presented um, two time periods that allow some um, trend, not trend, but uh, uh, time analysis, temporal analysis. 71% uh, were do downloadable, 92% were complementary to national information, 48% nevertheless. Uh, do not present a clear method or could be replicated uh, for Colombia. And out of all the layers evaluated, eight are currently um, um, used uh, to develop all the the process of the, um, of presenting them uh, with a bio tablet. And those eight are those eight are in on your screen in tax forest landscape last and in of the wild biodiversity impact and so on. Okay, so I want to finish um, presenting and discussing a little the NASA supported collaborations that uh, Humboldt is part in which Humboldt is participating right now. And there, there are five projects uh, with two different approaches, uh, top down or bottom up, basically. The top-down projects built on publicly available information um, that describe global patterns and comes from remote sensing mostly to build uh, products that could be applied to Colombia. And the bottom-up uh, projects are projects that built on information either regionally or nationally available within Colombia to, to uh, uh, present methods or approaches that could be impact that could have impact globally. So the the first, the top-down products, um, there are three, the Life on Land project and using spatial data for to inform national biodiversity planning. Those are led by Andrew Hansen from the Montana State University. And the idea uh, is to improve the use of spatial data either for uh, national reporting on biodiversity or biodiversity modeling and forecasting. The third uh, of those uh, pro uh, projects is quantifying forest vertical structure using spatial bond lighter, led by Patrick Hans and Scott Debs. And the idea is to classify um, forests uh, all over the world but using structural information coming from lighter. And for Colombia in particular, um, this will be very useful. The bottom up projects uh, one is led by Maria Cecilia Lundonio from Humboldt uh, in cooperation with Victor Gutierrez for, from Temple University. And the idea is integrating earth observation from decision for decision making in Colombia. Um, this project aims to identify um, es essential biodiversity and indicators that matters to communities and build or help building a uh, monitoring system and decision support system uh, for those communities. The second pro project is led by Mary Blair and um, in co collaboration with Elki Noguera from Humboldt. And the idea is expanding the Wallace Biodiversity software to support national biodiversity change indicators. Um, and this is built from the bottom up because from Humboldt uh, for several years, we have been uh, building this uh, Bio Modelos platform, 
which is basically a platform that provides um, special distribution distribution models, but goes beyond just building the models and whose collaboration among experts validate those models. So the idea with this project is to um, to uh, uh, to gear up um, by bio models with the WADAS software developed by the American Museum of Natural. So there, there are several initiatives from Humboldt that contribute to those projects, the bioindicators that I have already discussed, the biotableros, which is like the the, the application um, for decision support system, and the biomodelos. And I will finish with the contact information from for the researchers that lead the projects that I have presented. I'm the lead all the lead researcher for the degradation and action by tropical forest. Paola Isaacs leads the restoration ecology efforts. Camilo Correa is the main researcher for the human footprint project. Maria Cecilia Londoño leads the Geo Bon, the Bon Colombia and the Bio Tablero um, initiative. Uh, Elkin Noguera leads the Biomodelos initiative. And for any questions you could have regarding the seminar, you can also contact me. Uh, and those are uh, the emails for uh, the researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susanna. We really appreciate the examples you just shared on using spatial data in Colombia. Before we head into our final question and answer session, I want to paint a picture of where we're headed with our work in the UN Biodiversity Lab. Raphael introduced you to this in his presentation, but I'm also excited to announce that with funding from the Global Environment Society, National Geographic, the Global Environmental Facility, and One Earth, we are working with five countries, including Costa Rica and Colombia, to map their essential life support areas. We define essential life support areas as areas that together conserve critical biodiversity and also provide humans with essential ecosystem services, such as carbon storage, food, fresh water, water filtration, and disaster risk reduction. We are working with our pilot countries to use the best available global and national spatial data to first identify where these areas actually are. Then we're using cutting edge science on systematic conservation planning and spatial analyses to help countries identify the most effective places to, to take action to protect, restore, and manage nature in order to most efficiently deliver the key benefits you see on this slide. This analysis can be tailored based on key national priorities and challenges and will help identify the nature-based solutions that countries can take to deliver across their biodiversity, climate, and sustainable development commitments. Stay tuned. We are really looking forward to sharing the initial results of this work with you later this year. In conclusion, I want to thank Raphael, Christian, Susanna, and all of you for the opportunity to share this work. Back over to you, Amber. Thank you so much, Christina, Raphael, Christian, and Susanna for those fantastic presentations. I really appreciate getting the real world examples and you all are doing such important work. I also wanna thank you all who are online with us today for being here. We will move on to the question and answer portion of the training, but if we don't address your questions, you can follow up with um, myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez, and our email addresses are shown here. If you have general questions about the RCEP program, you can contact Anna Pradas, our program manager. And then again, um, please do make use of the RCEP website. We have um, trainings in many different areas, such as water resources and health and air quality. Um, if you all are interested in those areas too, there's a wealth of information there on the RCET website. So as we mentioned previously, please enter your questions into the Q&A box. And uh, what we're going to do is pull those over into a um, Google form and display that right now for you all to see as we work through the questions and we provide answers to them. 
So thank you all for being here with us uh, throughout this training series. Uh, we're so grateful to have such a um, broad global audience with us for this training. So thank you, and we will now move on to the question and answer portion. All right, everyone. Um, well, just bear with us for a moment as we pull up the um, questions. And thank you all for um, starting to ask them um, as the uh, webinar took place. Um, a few things I want to mention before we jump into the questions. Um, the homework is now posted on the training website. And we also provided the link to complete the homework um, in the chat as well. Um, so if you are interested in that certificate of completion, if you've attended the three live webinars, um, please do complete that homework um, within two weeks. So the deadline for that is um, April 21st. I also wanted to mention we have another upcoming training focused on um, agricultural applications um, coming up starting on April 14th. Um, so please do visit the RSET website and sign up for that if you're, if you're interested in agriculture applications. This is our first training focused in that um, area uh, with RSET. Um, and now it looks like we have the question and answers um, up on the screen and I will hand it over to our uh, guest presenters to um, answer some of those. Great, thank you, Amber. This is Christina. I think the first question is for us at UNDP. So question one asks, I was wondering if it's possible to download shapefiles from the UN Biodiversity Lab to be used on ArcGIS and other platforms with credit, of course. And the response is that most spatial data in the UN Biodiversity Lab can be exported into many standard GIS formats, including geo packages, ESRI shape files, geosuns, et cetera. However, there are some data sets that we're simply not allowed to share um, per our data use agreements with other data providers. So if you have specific questions, that's pretty clear on the websites, which you can and cannot download, and you can also reach out to us. To find out how to do that process, in last week's webinar, we discussed the exact steps for downloading shape files from the UN Biodiversity Lab. You can access both the presentation and the recording on the NASA Arrest webinar page, or you can follow the steps to do this in our UN Biodiversity Lab downloadable user guide. And when the responses to these questions and answers are sent out, those links will be included. The second question asks if we could provide a link to our study and update of spatial on the uptake of spatial information by countries and i can say that yes we can we'll share the links uh, again with the question and answer responses for this webinar series you can note that we launched the preliminary results of this analysis in november during the convention on biological diversity's 23rd meeting of the subsidiary body on scientific technical and technological advice um, otherwise referred to as up to 23 we're working to finalize the data now. We're still analyzing six national reports that have been submitted to the CBD between November 2019 and now. And we plan to release a final version of the analyses by August 2020. And the paper is called Nature's Counting on Us, Mapping Progress to Achieve the Convention on Biological Diversity. The third question looks at how the human footprint is calculated using global data and the authenticity of this data. So the human footprint helps us to spatially understand the extent of human modifications of natural habitats. It's calculated using eight globally consistent data sets, and these include one built environment, two population density, three electric infrastructure, four croplands, five pasture lands, six railways, seven major roadways, and eight navigable waterways. The resulting data quantifies human pressure on ecosystems around the world. 
The data is validated using high resolution images from 3,560 randomly sampled points, each of which is a square kilometer located across the Earth's non-Antarctic land areas. Um, you can find out more information in the peer-reviewed publication on the human footprint, and we'll send out that citation. And then if you'd like a link to the pre-published version of the report, because you don't have access to the actual peer-reviewed publication, we can also share that upon request. Question four looks at um, <clears throat> how we can support you in accessing the spatial data on the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, such as the Costco Biosphere Reserve. Um, using the UN Biodiversity Lab. So the idea is that you can access this data on the UN Biodiversity Lab from the public site. You just have to go to www.unbiodiversitylab.org and use the search bar to find the data layer. You can access it by typing biosphere in the search bar. And when you do this, the UNESCO Biosphere Reserves will appear. You can then visualize the data for the geography you choose, such as your country. Question number five relates to my presentation on Papua New Guinea and how logging concessions are recorded in their database. Um, the data is the Papua New Guinea Red Plus and Forest Monitoring web portal. That's where it comes from. We'll share a link for you to be able to access it. The logging concession boundaries are managed by the Papua New Guinea Forest Authority. All expired and operational concessions are displayed in the portal. For new concessions that are authorized, the boundaries are added. Question six asks if we can check tourism activities like trekking corridors and mountainous areas in the UN Biodiversity Lab. The response is that we don't have UN Biodiversity Lab data specific to tracking tourism activities in mountainous areas. However, you could use the human footprint to monitor human activities and their impacts in the regions that you're interested in. And then question seven, Amber, I'll turn back over to you that asks about the different, how NASA is differentiating between various types of vegetation. Great, uh, thanks, Chrissy. Um, this is a really uh, good question and something we get a lot. And the, it, there's not an easy answer, um, but I will say that um, in some cases, NASA uh, data can be used to differentiate between really broad classes of vegetation, such as things like agriculture versus, versus forests. And um, with multispectral sensors like Landsat, the wavelength range uh, for each band is really broad. So um, the uh, red and near infrared for example are, are too broad really to differentiate between different species types of vegetation um, so in order to do that um, to map species like invasive species you really need hyperspectral data where there are uh, many uh, bands or wavelength ranges within the uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum that can differentiate between different peaks in different types of vegetation. Um, and those types of data are, are really useful, however, they are not available on a uh, global repeat basis like, um, for example, Landsat. Um, there have been some hyperspectral um, sensors flown on planes for very specific regions. Um, these are things like Avarice, and I've provided the link um, to, to that here in the, the document that you have access to. Um, but I do want to mention that NASA is hoping to develop a hyperspectral satellite-based system, um, and we're in development right now for that, so I don't have a timeline on it. But um, the hope is to be able to better understand these changes in ecosystems related to differences in um, uh, types of vegetation. So stay tuned for that. Um, we are also interested in potentially having a training on hyperspectral data. So if, if this is something that is interesting to a lot of people, please do indicate that in the survey that we will send out um, After the uh, completion of the, the webinar. So 
Um, oh, and, and we also listed a few other uh, trainings such as our um, NDVI, our Normalized Difference Vegetation Index training there. Um, that's helpful for identifying vegetation, but again, um, difficult to identify specific species. Um, all right, well, back. Great, thank you, Amber. The next question is for the Costa Rica team. If you could talk a bit about how you're mapping indigenous territory, that would be great. Sure, in Costa Rica, the National Institute of Rural, Rural Development in there uh, generated the layer that we show in our presentation. They work with the ind indigenous communities to prepare this information and we, we uh, can provide more details if required. Here we can we share an image of the map uh, of the different indigenous territories in our in our country. Uh, if you're interested, you can have it from the Q and A document, or we can share it with you. Thank you. Great, thank you. I was going to add a little bit more from the UNDP side. So from the UNDP side, there's a lot of amazing indigenous-led work going on to map traditional lands and resources, such as the work supported by the Digital Democracy in many different countries or by ALDEA in Ecuador. The World Resource Institute's landmark platform also provides indicative mapping efforts of indigenous lands. There are two important aspects of this work to UNDP that I wanted to touch on. First, we believe that it's essential to spatially document the role indigenous people and local communities play in conserving, restoring, and sustainably managing nature. We want to make sure that these efforts are recognized in international policy processes, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity and by indigenous people's own governments. Second, we feel it's essential to support communities to map their lands and traditional knowledge, whether to enhance their work to obtain land tenure or to strengthen documentation of ecological knowledge. We're working with the World Wildlife, Worldwide Fund for Nature, World Resource Institute, the ICCA Consortium, and UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Center, and representatives from indigenous groups to globally map indigenous lands and demonstrate how their management contributes to the objectives of the CBD. We're also starting to explore with various indigenous groups how to how the private project spaces in the UN Biodiversity Lab could enable them to consolidate all their spatial data in a central repository and choose which parts of that they would like to share publicly. The next question, question nine, nine, focuses on how we can use the UN Biodiversity Lab for wildlife conservation, and can you use it to actually map wildlife species? The answer is yes. You can use the UN Biodiversity Lab information in combination with national data, such as physical, a geographic variable to analyze wildlife conservation. This question is closely linked to Aichi Biodiversity Target 12 on endangered species, which, was, which is one of our focuses at UNDP and the UN Biodiversity Lab. So because of that, you can simply go into the platform and find several data layers that have links to wildlife conservation. You just go to www.unbiodiversitylab.org and click the button Aichi Biodiversity Target 12 and the data layers that are most useful to achieve the Aichi Biodiversity Target will be available. And they include things like species richness or threatened species richness. Okay, so then the next question, question 10, relates to the COVID-19 outbreak, which I'm sure is on everyone's mind. Uh, there's a curiosity to learn if there are efforts to study biodiversity related impacts of the COVID-19 outbreaks. The question states that there's the thought that there would be a change in human activity conditions in such global manner that would provide an interesting data set and potential to learn something new. Air pollution is obvious, but what about other factors? I'll turn it over to the Costa Rica team to start. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. This is a question that has been shared to us not only here but also from the local media. They are very interested in knowing some of the impacts related to COVID-19, related to biodiversity or pollution or, or other variables. Um, since this is very recent, we don't have data or we haven't studied the, the more recent data to get to some conclusions, but we're compiling all the questions 
uh, related to COVID-19 and see if to find ways to to study them and make data make this information available. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think that we're in a really similar place. This is something that we're starting to have a lot of discussions about, and it's also a very quickly emerging topic. Uh, we're currently seeing the impacts of an established pandemic on medical infrastructure and frontline health workers during this critical stage for avoiding and intercepting emerging zoonosis in the interface of human interactions with the national environment. This is most acute in locations of rapid land use change. There is a preliminary risk map for global hotspots and potential future emerging infectious diseases sites that's become available in nature, and we'll share the link to that article. This work has identified risk locations for zoonosis, as well as those with intact evergreen broadleaf forests, low population density, increasing temperature and rainfall, and high richness invertebrate species. At UNDP, we're also working with Oscar Venter at the University of Northern British Columbia and James Watson at the University of Queensland, the Wildlife Conservation Society, and UNDP teams that are focused on health and crisis relief to see how we can address some of the weaknesses in that initial study and share those results with governments and in-country partners to transform our approaches to mitigate future outbreaks. If you're interested in this, contact Annie Verning at um, Annie, A N N E dot V I R N I G at UNDP.org, and we'll send out her contact information with these notes. All right, the next question, question 11, shifts to data that may be available for other sustainable development goals outside of those that are strictly related to nature at UNDP. So at UNDP, we're continuously working to make new data available on biodiversity and sustainable development for our users. UNDP also has the desire to make the UN Biodiversity Lab an institutional resource, which would broaden its focus from being nature-based to including additional data sets that relate to human well-being. For example, our colleagues are exploring how we can create one or more indices that could place an environmental lens on the Human Development Index, and we're considering how we could develop overarching questions to frame the index, such as the degree to which the extent of change in natural, natural capital enables countries to achieve key sustainable or nature development SDGs. I'll say that again. So we're looking at indices such as the degree to which the extent of change in natural capital enables countries to achieve key sustainable development goals. This is still a really early discussion, but something that we're excited to explore further. And we'll also share the links to the paper on the Human Development Index. Question 12 asks oh. if there's any specialized ecosystem maps available for the Asia region. region? Uh, this is a great question and we'll check with our team following the webinar and have a concrete answer for you in the published version of these notes. If there's specific countries or ecosystems that you're looking for more information on in Asia, please do let us know. Okay. There's several questions related to Colombia, and Susanna's having some connectivity issues today, so she's going to be responding to those in written form, and we'll share them in the final version of the notes. Great. Well, thank you, Tina, um, Rafael, Christian, Annie, Susanna, um, for those great presentations and for um, going through many of these questions. Um, we are at time now, so we're going to end our session today. Um, a few reminders before we go. Uh, we will be um, answering as many of these questions as possible, um, as Christina mentioned, and we will be posting um, the Q&A document to the RSET website after we've gone through and reviewed all of these. So you can have that as a resource for later on. Um, do please complete the homework. Uh, we've provided the link here and the link is also on the training website um, by April 21st, so that's two weeks from now. Um, and I just again want to say one final thank you uh, to everyone involved in this training as well as you all across the world for being with us um, today and the past two weeks. Uh, this has been a really exceptional webinar and we've had, I think we're breaking some records in the number of people who are participating across the world. So 
thank you all for that. Um, it's been uh, quite a, a great experience. Um, so enjoy the rest of your day and um, do take care everyone.